Welcome to the Nautical Institute, the international body for maritime professionals. Helping our members to develop their knowledge and professionalism lies at the heart of what we do. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, my membership in the, the Nautical Institute has allowed me to grow as a mariner. It helps you interact and network with other like-minded individuals all over the world. Our industry is changing rapidly and you are having to cope with new regulations, new technology and evolving best practice. You will actually have to link up or team up with a specific branch somewhere in the world and they will give you feedback, their views. I think that just really adds to your professionalism and it will basically be of great help. Our website is the first port of call to learn more about us and the ways we can support you. CPD Online is a programme that enables maritime professionals to keep current, to keep up to date. The whole programme is driven on templates that are downloadable from the website. So if you're at sea without internet access, you can download them and take them with you. They can be completed electronically or by hand. And all of the tools and guidance that you'll need to complete these templates and to follow the programme through are provided online. The Institute is a superb vehicle for ensuring professionals are able to keep up with their professional development. How else can you stay at the cutting edge? Another great advantage of membership is the Seaways uh, magazine, which contains many, many articles, is published every month, and has a large amount of information for members on all kinds of uh, shipping and nautical activities. We have the ability to communicate with each other, voice concerns, put that either on the internet, on the website, or through Seaways. The Institute produces a great range of publications and as a member I receive 30% discount which is just fantastic. The Nautical Institute is about publishing best practice and one of the ways that we do that is through our publications. They are written by seafarers or experts in their field for seafarers. So they're in seafarers language. They're there to help you throughout your career as you rise through the ranks and perhaps as you come ashore and start a new discipline. Go to our website at nordinst.org to find out more about the benefits of becoming a member. While you're there, explore the range of free resources, such as the reports submitted under our Mariners Alerting and Reporting Scheme. These confidential accounts of accidents and near misses are there to help us all stay safe whether at sea or ashore. You'll also find out about the work we do to make our members' views known at key industry forums, including the UN's International Maritime Organization and IALA. The Institute is at the forefront of making sure that the mariner's voice and the seafarer's voice is heard and given prominence. I think it's really beneficial that the members' views are represented at key international forums such as the IMO because it gives seafarers a voice. Belonging to the Nautical Institute and Nautical Institute's um, philosophy of engaging with rather than disputing or debating, uh, to constructively engage with similar bodies with the common aim of running a safe and efficient shipping. That has tremendous value to the sense of control that an individual uh, member feels. The Nautical Institute also offers accreditation services that support industry best practices. As a member of the Nautical Institute, you'll be entitled to use letters after your name, reflecting your professional status. Having that experience, having those letters after my name, having the credibility of being a member of the Nautical Institute really helped me in my career. It gave me an indication as an employer that the candidate was serious about the industry he was working in. You'll also have access to a dedicated members area on our website that includes discounts on entry to leading industry events. There is so much we can offer as a Nautical Institute. Our seminars, our conferences are absolutely top-notch. I got the value of being a member of the Nautical Institute, particularly through networking. I needed to meet these people to advance my career. Run by members for members, the Nautical Institute provides you with the ideal framework to support your professional role within the industry. Want to know more? Email us at member at or call us on 020 7928 1351. That's London, so dial country code 44 if calling from outside the UK. We'd love to hear from you. 
we have a tendency, uh, mariners do, to believe that our way in our little part of the world, this must be the only way to do it. And of course, there's there's a thousand ways to do it. And and th that broadening of our horizons, it's good for everybody. The Nautical Institute provides that platform. It's a wonderful organization. Uh, which has an outreach which is worldwide. Without the Nautical Institute, I don't think I would be the mariner I am today. As an international, independent and self-governing body, the Nautical Institute is here to serve you throughout your career as a maritime professional. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the sixth mini webinar of the Office of the Watch series organized by the Youth Forum of Nautical Institute Sri Lanka branch. I'm Keshav Yenage, moderator for the today's webinar and our topic today is search and rescue. So apart from the Zoom, uh, I would like to remind you all that we are live streaming this webinar through YouTube as well in our Nautical Institute Sri Lanka branch YouTube channel. And uh, I would like to remind you all again about the, uh, during the webinar, you can ask uh, questions in our comment section. And uh, so to be, uh, start with our webinar today, we have two speakers and let me introduce our uh, first speaker. Uh, he's Rear Admiral Kanchana Banagoda. He joined the regular forces of the Sri Lanka Navy and uh, received the commission in September, 1991. Uh, he has followed professional training in Sri Lanka, not only Sri Lanka, but also in UK, India, Bangladesh, and Australia as well. He has obtained graduate qualification in management and uh, postgraduate qualification in human resource management and maritime policy. He has served in command, staff, and instructor spheres in naval as well as tri service environment. He has steadily progressed in professional career and elevated to the rank of Rear Admiral on 4th May, 2022. Having uh, completed inaugural national defense course in Sri Lanka, currently he is serving as the commander uh, of Southeast, uh, Southeastern Naval Area and based in Sri Lanka Navy Ship Mahanaga, uh, pa uh, Potuville. And uh, so let me welcome Rear Admiral Barnagoda. Uh, thank you very much to participate and uh, uh, spending your time uh, for the youth of maritime community. Over to you, Rear Admiral Barnabada. Uh, Rear Admiral Barnabada, please go ahead. So may you check the mic, please. Good evening, Keshava. Uh, good evening, Kavya Banagara. We can re uh, hear you loud and clear. Please go ahead. My screen is being shown. Yes, we have your screen as well. That's good. Good evening, gentlemen and uh, ladies, if any. Shown in the screen is the rescue of three fishermen. Henry Shogun on 11 July 2022. Similarly, Sri Lanka Navy ship Ranarisi rescued a fisherman who was trapped inside the capsized fishing vessel on 11 December 2022. This was subsequent to the cyclone Mandas that brewed in the Bay of Bengal last year. There were 331 maritime incidents reported in 2022. 
The majority was from the Sri Lankan fishing vessel community that accounted for 74% of total incident. The graph on your right shows that 203 fishing vessels were accounted amounted to 74 percent. Distress incidents reported in Colombo are on the rise. Technical breakdowns have significantly increased by 25 percent. Here, instances of man-o-board as well as capsizing were reported. Sadly, only one man was recovered. That too was from a Sri Lankan fishing vessel. This brings to the topic of today's discussion, search and rescue operation. And the contents are as flashed on the screen. Search and rescue, or commonly known as SAR or SAR, is a global necessity where all states recognize the responsibility of providing search and rescue services. Uh, to well, Arnakoda, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, can we proceed to the next uh, slide? Uh, this slide uh, we can we have a blank slide. Then. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, now it's clear. Thank you. The term search and rescue could be divided into two segments, search and rescue. Briefly said, search is an operation coordinated to locate the persons in distress, whilst the kind of rescue operations, we intend to evacuate those to a safe place. The International Maritime Organization, IMO, and the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO are the two lead agencies under the United Nations that work towards safe transportation of aero and maritime assets. Through member states, these two agencies work very closely to prevent and manage distress situations and promote international cooperation. The Maritime Safety Committee, MSC, of the IMO divided the world ocean into 13 regions as depicted on the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the documents that provide legal basis for search and rescue in global terms. The SOLAS Convention of 1974, which was created in the aftermath of the Titanic disaster, it directs the contracting parties to promote distress communication and coordination within the area of responsibility by establishing, operating, and maintaining search and rescue facilities. Then, the Search and Rescue Convention of 1979 is the prime body that governs with maritime search and rescue. It provides directions for organization and coordination of search and rescue services, cooperation between states, and operating procedures. Then comes the Convention of International Civil Aviation of 1944, also named the Chicago Convention. This addressed the need for safe, regular, efficient, and economical air transport globally. There are other documents like the COSPAS SARSAT Agreement of 1988, which was initiated by the former USSR, USA, France, Canada, to provide satellite aided search and rescue services and to develop regional operations. Then the very well known United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea of 1982, in here, the need to render assistance to the distressed at sea is specified as a duty. Finally, it is the 1989 Salvage Convention. It binds the master of a ship to assist 
a person in danger at sea without compromising the safety of his vessel. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very familiar chart that denotes the responsibility of Sri Lanka. That is nearly 27 times of her landmarks. We in Sri Lanka share boundaries with India, Maldives, Australia and Indonesia, especially because of our fishermen. Authorities in Colombo keep regular communication with India and Maldives. Search and rescue organization in Sri Lanka could be mainly divided into two parts, maritime and air. When we talk about local arrangements, the responsible organizations and structures are depicted in the screen. Firstly, the Maritime Rescue Coordination Center or MRCC is the lead agency in this regard. I believe there was a presentation done by the Youth Forum and uh, the senior staff officer of MRCC came up with his understanding on the function of the MRCC. Ladies and gentlemen, this responsibility was earlier vested with the Director General Merchant Secretariat, but since 2014, it has been transferred to the Sri Lanka Navy. Joining the effort with the Sri Lanka Navy is the Sri Lanka Coast Guard when it comes to sharing of assets. Then, it is the Air Rescue Coordination Center or ARCC which is charged under the Civil Aviation Authority of Sri Lanka. Connected to it is the Sri Lanka Air Force that has the ability to deploy assets. According to this search and rescue conversation, there are major obligations of contracting parties, namely building infrastructure, installing equipment, staffing, training for hygiene work relations are considered important in search and rescue. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a number of parties involved with search and rescue as shown in the slide. By default, the process will be commenced with a person or a vessel in distress who would emit the distress alert. The alert in post will be any facility which could be able to receive the distress alert and reliably relay it to the rescue coordination center or unit. Examples that I can quote is the coastal radio station, the air traffic service unit having the necessary radio network, Colombo radio and any other air traffic service. Rescue coordinating centers are established for the purpose of coordinating the conduct of search and rescue operations. They may not necessarily need to provide search and rescue facilities, yet it will coordinate what is available. It is required to offer 24-7 service through a rapid and a reliable communication network which is manned by competent personnel. Ladies and gentlemen, it is important to use the language of English in this regard for easy dissemination as well as understanding. Then there would be the search and rescue facilities, the units, and an on-scene coordinator who would handle the whole rescue effort. Let us now see the types of alerts or sources that would initiate or coordinate or progress the search and rescue effort. Popular websites such as the marine traffic, 
the specialized network such as the sea vision the navigation and telics search and rescue task forces long range identification and tracking devices emergency positioning indicating radio beacons could signal the point or the event of distress similarly the m surface picture the atlantic merger vessel emergency reporting surface picture the vessel monitoring system and the hexadecimal decode program could identify or pinpoint the unit in distress similarly the inmars set ships directory would also help us to identify who is in distress why is the e broadcasting is used to disseminate the necessary information to other units the drift modeling held by various agencies could assist us in locating or helping or progressing this uh, search and rescue effort gentlemen there are three kinds of search and rescue facilities the designated search and rescue units the specialized search and rescue units and other facilities with regards to the sri lanka navy the advanced offshore patrol vessels such as the, the ships which are depicted in the picture having a good speed a wider range and a big holding capacity going up to 450 personnel it has own rescue craft train men divers to undertake the rescue mission similarly the fast missile vessel having the speed of 30 knots a, a, a moderate range it has train men when at sea the gunboats the fast attack craft although not a designated platform coupled with the inshore patrol craft which we use very close to our sea shores are used for search and rescue mission going over to sri lanka air force the beach craft is primarily used for surveillance the white oval fixed wing aircraft also used for surveillance and medical evacuation age but the a32 fixed wing aircraft also were used for surveillance and medical evacuation the newly introduced drone maritime patrol aircraft received from india at the moment sri lanka air force is manning whereas the pilot conversion conversion as well as training of observers is ongoing is a maritime patrol aircraft used for surveillance and could be utilized for medical evacuation the bell 212 rotary wing aircraft used for winch and bowman kit for rescue medical evacuation helicopter emergency medical services and rope rescue similar with bell 412 having a better speed and the mi 17 having a top speed of 100 knots which could be used in the same line ladies and gentlemen it is not worthy to mention the assistance extended by merchant vessels and fishing vessels that fly our ocean space many of our fishermen have been rescued by the captain and crew of merchant vessels bearing different flags for which we are thankful similarly some of the fishing vessels have been a source of information 
and recovery in our sea area. Common capabilities of search and rescue missions are indicated in the screen. Reach of our units is achieved through speed, maneuverability, endurance, and continuity. If one unit has lost the endurance, the other would continue. Surveillance and tracking are achieved through radar, visual means, and two of our platforms are capable of night vision. Similarly, our platforms are well connected to different forms of communication, having means for rescue, diving, firefighting, damage control, and medical evacuation, which are undertaken by trained personnel. It is important to reach the distress scene quickly as possible and prevent or reduce the severity of accident and hardship of the survivors. Further, the search and rescue unit should be capable of delivering survival equipment and other supplies to the scene. Also, rescuing the survivors and providing them with food, medicine, and other basic essential needs is a must, and it is required to transfer them to a safe place. Reducing the vulnerabilities of survivors and ensuring their sustainability are essential conditions in an SR search and rescue mission. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, it is now clear that the role of the government as well as the seafarers that has to play in it comes to search and rescue missions at sea. Having the assets and arrangements for coordination, the government through two of its main arms function the search and rescue operations in our designated region. It is a well-recognized global necessity where all states have come together to save lives in distress at sea. After all, it is nothing but the help of a mariner to another mariner without regards to nationality. With this, I come to the end of my speech and I would like to thank the Nautical Institute of Sri Lanka branch for giving me this opportunity, and also the staff officers of Sri Lanka Navy and Sri Lanka Air Force for providing necessary data in making the content. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rear Admiral Banagoda. It was a very informative and to the point presentation from your side. We highly appreciate the content value and your effort uh, for giving this valuable webinar input. So uh, without further ado, I will move on to our second speaker today. Uh, that is our Captain Mihira De Silva. Uh, Captain Mihira uh, is a master mariner since 1992. He has uh, 25 years of experience as a master and uh, he has saved sailed on vessels, uh, container vessels, bulk carriers, tankers, and car carriers. So apart from uh, CFR out at sea, uh, he have, uh, have experience as an ex examiner in the Ministry of Shipping in Sri Lanka, and also as a lecturer uh, in nautical science in University of Moratua, and uh, visiting lecturer as uh, CINEC, and also he is an uh, ex uh, mooring master, SPM Colombo OPL. So, uh, thank you very much, Captain Mihira, to be with us today here. Over to you, Captain. Uh, Captain, you may unmute. Okay. Okay. We share the screen now. Okay, thanks uh, Keisha for the nice introduction about me and okay. Uh, so I will talk from the Merchant Navy aspect. I think we saw a very good speech by uh, the Rear Admiral, the role of uh, Sri Lankan Navy. Okay, here I will talk about, well, 
search and rescue at sea, role of the ship master and uh, his crew. All right, now this slide show, all right, in the door was read, a merchant navy vessel crew being rescued by both, by, okay, so, uh, watercraft and uh, the helicopters. Okay, uh, then, uh, okay, now, okay, now, I will see the responsibility of the master, all right, uh, uh, that's in regulation to assist person distress at sea when you can do so without endangering the lives of you and your crew. There's a legal obligation and of course, there's a moral obligation as well. Okay, now thing is you can't let the people die at sea before your very eyes, you know. Uh, that's your you know, moral obligations. You know, if I do it, if I am in ignorant, probably I, I won't be able to sleep even after I retire. All right, now there's a IMO Solas Regulation 33. Or, okay, now a master of a ship at sea, which is in position to be able to provide assistance on receiving information from any source that persons are in distress at sea, is bound to proceed with all speed to their assistant. Here you may have well, a charter instruction, voyage instructions to proceed at economical speed. Here you override that. Okay, you proceed at full speed. If possible, informing them uh, or the search and rescue service that ship is doing so, included the obligation delivered to a place of safety, uh, their human treatment on board the rescue ship. All right. So when you are Proceeding for a distress uh, to assist a vessel, uh, if possible, you inform them you are doing so. And of course, the rescue coordination center. Uh, all right, then I go to next slide. Uh, all right, there are, okay, I think Ray Admiral talk about this AMSA manual, okay. Uh, this uh, part three is a, Mandatory, mandatory manual on the vessel. You should have the latest, the updated publication. So this is both by International Civil Aviation Organization and IMO. All right. So the part three normally contain guideline for search and rescue in terms of shipping and aviation. So here, uh, not only shipping, even the aviation is taking part. <clears throat> All right. Get unclosed. All right, just read it. All right, Article 98 to impose a general duty and state parties to require their vessel to render assistance to any person found at sea in danger of being lost and to proceed with all, uh, all possible speed to the rescue of person in distress, inform of the need of assistance in so far as such action may reasonably expected. All right, so there are other publications which are available on board, which, which, is, which could be used, which in fact, which are used in uh, search and rescue operations. That is uh, uh, IMO, into, I can't see the search and rescue, uh, uh, SAR 1979, International Code of Signals. This is uh, where you have language difficulties, okay? IMO standard marine vocabulary because I am using it to, to deal with certain crew members. Then of course, IMO resolution guidelines on the treatment of person rescue at, rescue at sea. Of course, company safety management system, there are checklists or a preparation to rescue persons at sea. Of course, there are, there's a manual called large scale this rescue operations at sea by internal chamber of shipping. United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, 1951 convention. All right, this is a different scenario. Uh, it, well, the, you may have complication, you will face certain difficulties uh, when you rescue refugees. Okay, uh, we will talk about that later. Of course, the risk assessment on board. You had to do before any rescue operation, 
uh, to risk assessment, how will it affect your crew safety? All right, now, okay, now the, uh, let me see, okay. Okay, first, if you say like the procedure, if you receive a distress call or rather master's decision to assist, okay, he may assist, he may not assist on certain circumstances, okay? Uh, say like if the distress portion is too far, or uh, it's unreasonable for him to go there because say now first thing I check is when I receive a distress message on SATC, I check where it is. Sometimes I'm in the Southern Hemisphere, far in the Northern Hemisphere, more than a thousand nautical miles. So we don't have to go for that. And also there are certain other occasions and your are Banka Rubi, Fuala Rubi. Uh, and uh, of course, if it present danger to your own vessel and crew, say like a chemical tank on fire. So if you go there, there may be harmful gases uh, spreading over. So it till your crew is not safe for your crew. Uh, so there are other occasions because I don't want to talk in detail because we have a limited time. Okay, then once you decide to assist, all right, then uh, you have to acknowledge, there's a way of acknowledgement. You have to inform the distress vessel that you are coming well and also the uh, uh, RCC, Risk, uh, Rescue Coordination Center. So when you acknowledge, no, no, you will receive it on DSC. Usually the procedures let the coastal station uh, you know, acknowledge first, all right? Otherwise, if they don't acknowledge, you acknowledge whatever acknowledgement should be done on the, the voice channel, uh, voice channel, not on uh, DSC acknowledgement, then it will stop transmitting, okay? Now you go, at the full speed, all right, you can deviate any charter party, any terms and conditions in uh, PNI clubs, or hull and machinery, or whatever, even cargo carrying rules, Hague Bisbee rule, they allow, these are called allowable deviation, which are justified. So you don't need any permission. Uh, when you, you don't need any permission from your owner or charterer. So when you go for a distress, okay, you can inform them later. Okay, the other thing is uh, <clears throat> picking up survivors. All right, now thing is picking up survivors. You can, there are ways you can pick them directly from the distress vessel, provided it's safe to go alongside, or you can, you, you will pick them from the survival craft if they are floating or you can pick them uh, from the water, directly from the water. Okay, there are search pattern if survival is not found. Okay, you search patterns. I will just briefly explain search patterns. There are many search patterns in the IMSA manual, but I will uh, explain a couple of them. Okay, if survival is not found, you have to search for them. Then we talk about the communication with on-scene coordinator. If you are not the on-scene coordinator, all right, it basically on-scene coordinator on the, all right, uh, say like in the search SAR unit, he is the main person, all right. Normally, uh, he is a sort of a link between uh, you and the RCC, okay. Uh, then we talk about mass rescue operation, which is different and reporting is important. And finally, you have to tell the RCC the place of safety, where you will drop them. All right, then we talk about problems for merchant vessel in search and rescue operation. All right, now certain factors are affecting uh, because you do search and rescue in or in many part of the world, all right. Uh, well, sometimes there are certain problems, fog, haze, smog, presence of low cloud, precipitation like rain, snowfall, uh, weather condition, visibility by spray, your efficiency of your radars, 
floating material in the search area, time of the day, position of the sun, because that will affect your lookout, height of the lookout, accuracy of navigation, okay, not a real problem these days, got the GPS and like this, and of course the free boat, all right, like a car carrier, rescuing a person from a uh, boat, well, uh, the problem is, uh, okay, the free board, okay. Uh, search patterns are normally decided by, uh, sent to on-scene co coordinator by the RCC, depending on the situation, the search area. So you, they have to calculate a search area, execution, the coordination, and the communication, and the reports. Uh, Okay, I talk about certain sec, uh, search patterns, uh, okay, which, okay, which could be done by a single vessel, all right, the sector search. Usually, this is uh, done when the datum, or, okay, datum is accurately known, usually uh, done in man or boat situation, you are very sure. Well, almost sure about the uh, place the man went overboard. Maybe he went about maybe 10, 15 minutes ago. So he can't drift much. All right. So they say one single ship rescue operation, recommend man overboard. Advantage ship come to very fast initial starting position. So it's just like triangle, equal triangles. Okay. Say you, okay, you come to the datum, all right, where he went overboard. You will have it on your GPS, okay, the man overboard marker. And also, of course, on the, this, you can do it now. You come, proceed. The thing is, you are coming back to the same person he went overboard. And it's a, it's a two mile, depending on the visibility, you select the legs, all right, and you come back, okay. And again, you go 30 degrees away, you repeat, well, the same, all right? We call it sector search, usually done by a single vessel, uh, on a, especially on a man or boat situation. Uh, then we go to expanding square search. This is also done by a, usually a single vessel. I have done it practically. All right, in a search, but I never found the survivor. It's about the overdue boat, a last known, last known position. I got the last known position. That was uh, because the day they just uh, RCC tracked down the data. Uh, so I went for the last known position. So I was on urgent charter. I was about to cancel my lay can. So I started this one. You go to the data and go uh, as per squares. All right. So I did that for about maybe three to four hours. Finally, I made a log entry, informed the RCC. So I went on the voyage. Later on, I informed the charters owners. There's no problem. There's no problem for me, uh, get delay or anything like that. Okay. So very important. The, okay. I will tell you one example. All right. Okay. Uh, we don't have much time. All right. Very uh, important. Okay. These days you have, they have the tracking system. All right. Tracking system. I give one example. After I talk about these slides, I will give some example. Not much time left for me. All right. This is also very useful. Usually done by uh, the creep line search. All right. That's by, uh, well, the... <laughs> a vessel on the sea surface and a search and rescue aircraft. All right, this is called creep line search. Of course, in this uh, uh, search, ship goes on the scent in one direction and the aircraft, of course, can go ahead of the ship faster and go on creep line. So the advantage of the aircraft is he can detect far beyond the horizon. It detection range is far. So, okay, 
unless there are clouds clouds or right certain fog or bad weather so when he see the position he can see it faster than you he will just direct you to the position of course then we got the parallel tax search normally these are done by uh, two or more ships two or more ship this plan track plan is sent by the rcc all right all right now okay now this is i go for this one now when you must have refugees encountered at sea this is a problem all right so well, the thing is the regulation is all right i read refugees encountered at sea in a small unseaworthy craft and will probably indicate that they are in distress this for regulation says unseaworthy craft the mast of any ship encountering people under such circumstances is therefore under a statutory obligation to render assistance to them render assistance what kind of assistance it decide the master okay i remember when now second mate we met some boat people in some men south china sea the mast of course well uh, he just lowered medicine and food then just he went off all right uh, but they did not take them on board all right but the thing is now uh, if you take you have to you are, you are under legal obligation of course you have a moral obligation but when you pick them up okay there are other complication you have to face one thing your security of your own vessel all right security of your own vessel they may have hidden weapons like knives and they will uh, look innocent but uh, when they are on board they could be violent so you have to think about your own security other issue is uh, their health well they may be carrying infectious disease infectious disease which will threaten the threaten the health of your own crew and of course to we have to give them a shelter decent shelter some sort of food water sanitary facilities you can't accommodate them in the uh, you can't accommodate inside the accommodation of course after all then there are problems with the authorities all right of course with the especially with the immigration or all the laws is not easy to disembark in them immigration laws the sanitary laws all right probably uh, the sanitary laws uh, well health authorities will object to accept them because they think of their own country people's health they they are they may be vehicles of carrying infectious diseases so these are the problems you will face the only thing is or rather uh, the the official body responsible for care of refugees and implementation of the convention the united high commission of refugees the mast of the rescue ship should make arrangement to contact the nearest officer as soon as possible in fact not you you tell your owners and they will let the pni club usually the rescue person under the care of pni club here of course uh, all expenses are funded by the uh, unhcr uh, the later on pna cup will recover their expenses uh, so this is a problem of course probably many countries do not accept them all right probably the coastal state coast guard will rescue them but if you rescue them they won't take them uh, but Uh, there's nothing to worry as a master i believe you just rescue people distress at sea so let the owners decide what to do let the other organization you can see hr your pni club decide what to do all right uh, rescue at sea they are subject to the usual ship flag state okay so okay finally i have all right uh, this is uh, well not from uh, not from my ships all right i had the experience of medical evacuation of fighting miami all right that the us coast guard helicopter uh, evacuated yeah one of my sick crew members of course this how they did it 
uh, using high line technique. So they sent the winchman down, which uh, got him on board and he put him a stretcher, all right, it's called special name, I can't remember, got him out. Of course, they do, they assist a lot in search and rescue operation when the helicopters can rescue people from the ship itself. I had a, a slide, I can't, it won't missing. So the sinking ship, the last crew member was on the funnel. They rescue the last crew member from the funnel. They can rescue people from the survival craft. And of course they can rescue people from water itself. All right, so we got limited time. Okay, so, uh, so one thing I think, there are merchant navy officers here, maybe masters, junior officers. So thinking you have a legal obligations. Of course, you could go to jail if you are negligence in rendering assistance. The rules are like that. It well, okay. Now, uh, example, Costa Concordia Maris own crew. He was prosecuted for manslaughter. All right, there was another example I can't remember. There was a, a certain flag state vessel in Red Sea. All right, the master, the it turned on fire, it's a Roro. So the master just abandoned them. He ran away. So the government was looking for him. And also another same flag state vessel, the, okay, he did not rent assistance when he could do so. He was prosecuted and he went to jail. So decide, uh, all right, uh, you could end up in jail. So uh, we have limited time. Thank you very much. Okay, we can't cover all the areas we plan uh, because we have certain schedule to be followed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Captain Mihira. Of course, you are, uh, uh, how can I say, you are a, like experienced <laughs> man. <laughs> Uh, so much experience, uh, so much exposure so for the youth. There is a lot to take from you, but unfortunately, yes, as you said, we have a limited time. So, uh, so now uh, I would like to uh, move on to our question and answer session. So we have two top guns, uh, Rear Admiral Banagoda and uh, uh, our Captain Mihira. And there are a lot of questions uh, rising our chat. So I will try to squeeze as much as possible with our time frame. Uh, gentlemen, please, uh, and ladies, please raise your questions in the chat. And if we cannot answer all the questions here, I will make sure that uh, this will be bring into our youth forum WhatsApp group. And then we will get the answers from the speakers and then um, give you the responses. So uh, the first one uh, question came from uh, Hiruna. Uh, Mr. Hiruna, he have asked uh, uh, how to respond to a situation where Indian fishing boat found in distress in SL waters. I think this question is going to uh, Ria Admiral Barnagoda. Uh, I think this is a common question. I mean, common scenario we have heard in news as well. A lot of Indian fishing boats are getting captured in the our uh, Sri Lankan waters, uh, and and also I think apart from that, this is I think about a distress situation. Maybe the Indian fishing boat uh, got distressed in Indian waters and drifted to Sri Lankan waters. So he want to know how to re respond to a such situation. Uh, Rear Admiral Barnabada, could you please uh, respond to this one? Thank you, sir. The question is uh, how to assist or respond to the Indian fishing vessel. Uh, throughout our service experience, we have seen not many uh, boats uh, in distress in Sri Lankan waters. Uh, in addition, I should uh, mention the fact that uh, uh, other than for the distressed uh, vessels, there are not many flying in these waters intentionally. But I would uh, focus more on to the distress situation. Uh, firstly, uh, if the vessel is on distress, it is the uh, surface unit or else our coastal radar station that would be picking up 
the uh, unidentified or suspicious echo uh, that will be definitely verified through a visit that visit would be done by one of our units may it be the coast guard or the sri lanka navy we would approach the uh, suspicious vessel verify it is safe to be boarded and ascertain why it is there is it because of a genuine failure or is is it, is it failing something which is not so once the status is uh, ascertained we would uh, uh, record all the positions record all the times and record all the uh, yeah. occupants i mean uh, the uh, crew members who are in in, in place and uh, if uh, the, the same information would be relayed back to our control station or as we call the operations room necessary assistance if possible could be given if not we might have to uh, direct it to one of the safe ports where further action could be made there have been instances where a contact was made with the indian coast guard because uh, one or two indian coast guard ships would always be on patrol on the other side of the india we have a common communication procedure that could be informed to them and the message could be conveyed thereby handing over the vessel in distress to that authority there in itself but certainly we would investigate and try to help if it is possible hand over to the indian authorities or else we would bring it to a place of refuge assist in the repair and then arrange the departing procedure i hope i have addressed the question yes sir uh, yes we are miral banugada yes we got a very detailed uh, answer and uh, i think that is the uh, importance of this webinar so a lot of theoretical uh, details of course our young generation they can google and find it and uh, our young generation is quite advanced but uh, since you have we have you uh, you have a lot of practical exposure so i think our um, youth forum members are blessed to have you in this uh, webinar so that we can get especially uh, as a sl navy uh, rear admiral uh, I, i think the merchant navy Uh, young seafarers they can get from you and of course uh, from the uh, i think what i can see from the questions raised to captain mihira uh, like both of these uh, merchant navy and then the uh, ensign uh, i mean uh, the sl navy uh, th those young seafarers i think they have a lot of questions to ask uh, so our next uh, question uh, it is going to uh, captain uh, mihira so uh, i think this is uh, from a merchant navy gentleman mr mr milan uh, he have asked how to identify whether the refugee situation is or is true or false situation generated for piracy or hijacking purpose so i think uh, uh, the question is is clear because lot of incidents happen the, the pirates using this tactic i think that is what captain uh, he wanted to ask uh, as a marine uh, master mariner Uh, with your experience how to how to discuss yeah, of course this. i have the experience i have met this situation i will okay i really met this situation uh, yes, so i will another perfect you know, person what to what i did with this answer. okay say okay then you can see all right now uh, we were in red sea all right this high risk area red sea there were no armed guards on board so the chief mate pity gala is in australia now he called me around 4 o'clock in the morning captain i can see red parachute flares okay and on the vhf channel yeah in distress all right so i came on board then i heard okay now the, there are traffic in vicinity the coast stations of course all right now the things i waited all right then i yeah one of the ships said okay captain you are the nearest vessel because nobody wants to assist in this situation they suspected certain you know foul play or whatever okay now then i talked to them i uh, 
uh, talk to them. Okay, what kind of assistant you require? They gave the information. They are in a small of a tug. All right, they say they are flooding. All right, they are flooding. They need a pump. So then I call my crew. Well, some of the crew were not willing. Of course, we are in a high risk area. And uh, well, the thing is, we have to think about our own security. OK, yeah. then I send a message, message to Jeddah Coastal Radio Station. OK, now, uh, OK, then I circle around. So when it is dawn, all right, they say they are flooding. Of course, we did not have a, a type of pump they required. Then I circle around. Of course, now the thing is you can judge them. Very closely, I circled around with the lookout. They were not in danger, apparently. Of course, if you are flooding, there must be a change of trim or list. Or, all right, now the thing is people on board, maybe a few guys, all right, maybe six or six, some people are having a cup of tea smoking. All right. So not in a distressed situation. Then even the person who was continuously sending this flare, he was smoking. Well, I, I told them, you, you don't appear to be in distress. Then again, OK, please take us on board. All right. Then they are asking my destination. All right. Where's your destination, Captain? All right, uh, then I did not say anything. I said, it's my duty to, we are to drop you. If I take them on board, then uh, they asked, are you going to Australia? Then I gave a certain false port, which nobody wants to go. So they, they kept silence. So then I abandoned, I had clear evidence in my crew. Then I reported to Jeddah Coastal Station, Jeddah Radio. Uh, so this was a sort of a bogus distress call. So I use my sort of professional judgment in this case. Thank you, Captain Mira. I mean, fantastic answer. So all our young seafarers, rather than exposing to this kind of situation, uh, here, whatever uh, the you experience, I think that will be much benefit, benefited for them in first hand because rather than going for that situation, before that, uh, we have the knowledge uh, from your practical experience. So, uh, next question is going to uh, Rear Admiral Barnagoda. I think some this is kind of like a bridging uh, question. So, uh, Sure, this is from a merchant uh, seafarer. What are the actions can be taken to improve the communication between merchant ships and uh, naval ships? So, in I think uh, he's asking in a distress situation, how how the uh, merchant ship can assist uh, the naval ships? Because the of course naval ships uh, they have a, a much uh, knowledge about the local area when they come when they when the when they come to the search and rescue uh, situation. Uh, so, Re Admiral Barnabada, can you please uh, elaborate on this? Thank you very much, uh, Tesala. The question was to find methods of uh, communication, how it could be improved between the Navy and the merchant. Uh, a very valid question. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the information you have is uh, very much valuable to us and the information we have would be very valuable to you. So it is important for us to uh, exchange our information. In a search and rescue situation, all the necessary inputs that you have would be shared with the regional center that would give us also a certain uh, input but coming into close contact between the distressed vessel or is a vessel flying on the normal voyage where we come across, we have our usual channels open. All our operators are capable of communicating with you. The flag hoist. Captain uh, Mihira and Tesha would be able to tell us whether 
you gentlemen are still using the lights and the flags as we were taught during our cadet school. Having that procedure, having those procedures, the calling channel, the impression calling channel, and the flags would pave way for us to communicate and exchange the information. And it would be worthy for you all to know that at times uh, the Sri Lanka naval ships would not operate with the navigation lights. Our ships might be fully darkened. If you suddenly see uh, uh, an echo on your PPI without any navigation light, without any AIS, just have it in mind. If it is in the Sri Lankan waters, it could be one of us. But certainly, if you identify yourself or call in the calling channel, we would be in the listening watch. We would be having our ASS on the passive. We would be reading our data picture. We will not miss the huge uh, merchant vessel. But keep your, uh, I would request the watchkeeping officers to keep your radars, your communication, as well as the bridge watch open so that the first sight would create conditions for identification and communication that would make both of our lives easier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rear Admiral Varnagoda. So I think uh, this is the whole point of the uh, Nautical Institute. Uh, so to, to collaborate uh, between uh, the merchant and then the uh, uh, Navy personnel and then share their experience. And of course, with our youth forum, uh, that is our one of our primary targets as well. So I think this uh, served that purpose. So uh, next question, actually, uh, what I can what I can see from our uh, chat, uh, there are a lot of questions coming about the refugee situations. So in order to save the time, I will uh, collaborate a few of the question and uh, raise to Captain Mihira. So one was about the uh, if the the search and after the search and rescue, uh, if, uh, if that person get uh, passed away and uh, or get sick on board, so how how the uh, our young CPRs uh, or, uh, should handle this kind of situation and uh, as the as per the uh, uh, practice. You mean the rescue person, uh, he was sick or he died on board? Yes, uh, Captain, can you elaborate both these situations? Because it was coming from uh, two questions. One, uh, it, was, it is uh, mentioned as a refugee. So if... Uh, I see. So... All right. Well, well the thing is, uh, well, the thing is, uh, uh, all right, now, I think in my personal opinion, you have to treat them as a human being, all right? That's, you can't differentiate between a refugee and your own crew member. It's a human being, all right? Again, you have to think about your crew own safety, like uh, health safety. The person may be, all right, in a boat or uh, for a long time, he coming from a country where they have infectious diseases, infectious diseases. So, okay, the best thing is to consult now these days you can, uh, you can contact your owners, all right? Now, they got certain expertise. They can catch experts like p &I clubs could be very helpful in this situation. That is to protect the owner's interest. You have to uh, contact your owners and uh, tell him about the situation, sick or died on board. Very difficult situation in my personal. I never had a, such experience, all right? Now, the... Of course, your safety management system now after this COVID-19, now we have a pandemic management on board. There's something called pandemic management on, to, on board, how to uh, face a pandemic situation. So assume this is a pandemic situation, we don't know the cause of death. All right, could be due to some pandemic disease or yeah. natural cause, we are not sure about it. 
So you can also consult CIRM or write that is radio medical advice. Uh, or the thing is now, if I were or at first you have to think about the safety of the crew. If this dead or sick crew member is very difficult to discharge in a coastal state, because uh, I, as I mentioned before, they think about their own nation's health and safety. So what I do is if I were the master, okay, now treat him as a normal dead body. All right, in fact, you can't uh, treat people on race, caste or religion or whatever. So best thing now, you can't let the body okay, rot on board, all right? Okay, so that will present a, a bigger uh, health issue to all crew members. So if I the master, best thing, all right, now in the pandemic, uh, uh, in, in the pandemic management, there are pandemic kits, all right, there we have the like surgeons there, fully covered body, disinfection, many things, even you have the body bags. All right, other thing, all right, you have to get some volunteers, not many crew members are willing to handle the body. All right, uh, willing to handle the body. So you have to put them in a so body bag, body bag and the seal is sealed. So it's a seal unit. Uh, so then you have to remove meat from a meat or fish from a cool room. All right. And you have to adjust the temperature so you can get it from radio medical advice. Now we are not doctors. In fact, we don't have MBBS. So you get the radio medical advice. So preserve the body until uh, you get a reply from the show authority is your owner. So, all right, you pass the ball to owners. That's it. Even so, uh, sick crew member, you have to isolate him. All right, when you treat him, give him food, all right, you have to take all the precautions. Same precaution you uh, took for COVID-19. Uh, okay, that's, uh, that's my answer, short answer. Thank you again, uh, Captain Mihira, for that uh, uh, wonderful explanation. And uh, of course, there are a lot of questions coming through, but unfortunately, I have to respect the time. So this is the last uh, question. Uh, as well as I did for the Captain Mihira, I will collaborate a few of the questions and raise to uh, Rear Admiral Barnagoda. Uh, so uh, there are a few questions about the limitations of the air support during a search and rescue operation. So, and that that is the first part. And the second part, uh, maybe about the limitation of the SL Navy during a, a search and rescue operation. Uh, and then uh, maybe a little bit about the refugee, uh, handling refugee city situations in uh, SL waters. Uh, Rear Admiral Barnagod, could you please uh, kindly touch up on these three points? Yes, please. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, very quick answer. That is the uh, endurance that we are worried about. Uh, it may be the aircraft, it may be the small boats that you see. Uh, endurance would be a problem for us. The aircraft, although they say between three to five year, uh, hours of uh, airborne time is dedicated for the uh, search and rescue operation, the, the impediments of the weather would be again a concern. Bad visibility, wind conditions, rain would hamper the Sri Lankan air force. Both uh, forces have the impact of uh, in, uh, in the weather. However, we on the surface have a better option of staying. The AOPVs and the OPVs have a longer duration to stay. We are sustainable, whereas our small platform would not be as comfortable or as they would not be able to continue the search. But the AOPVs and OPVs, uh, gentlemen, ladies, we have stayed out at sea and uh, we have been out for the seafarers, being in the same fraternity. With regards to uh, the, there was another part in the question for refugees. The third week of December, we had a boatload of uh, refugees heading to East Asia. Somehow, the uh, 
they mentioned uh, cyclone condition altered their course and they ended up in the northern peninsula it was cited by our radar stations reported to our operations room the control center investigated and brought to the nearest place of refuge that is the kangasadure port given shelter medication food thereby abiding with all the uh, obligations placed upon us then handed over to the authority may it be the indian boats or any other nationality that is in distress we would handle with lot of responsibility with lot of care thereby ensuring they are taken out of danger and uh, kept in a secure place until the legal authorities do their part i think i have uh, answered the question okay sir yes uh, thank you very much we admiral banagada so uh, ladies and gentlemen so this will be the uh, end of our uh, webinar for the day so uh, in order to uh, bring this webinar to you we had a, a great support from our youth forum lead team uh, led by uh, uh, captain yasas telwat and uh, then also from uh, uh mr mario di silva tilanka sirimanna buddhika jayavira uh captain kushant samarakodi uh, mr hasant sampat uh, mr charit deshan di silva mr dinuk piris and a uh, lot of other supporters uh, in order to make this event successful so thank you very much for them and also for the uh, audience uh, we had a very solid audience today Uh, even though we extend uh, our time actually for the a lot of questions raised through the chat uh, so uh, but still we had a good participation almost reach our limits and uh, thank you very much for them also we would like to invite if somebody is not in our youth forum please uh, fill up the google form and then join with us uh, to participate this kind of events in the future and uh, also we have this Uh, we uh, webinar we will be posting in our youtube channel uh, nautical institute sri lanka branch youtube channel please subscribe that one and uh, keep uh, keep for more keep update for more uh, youtube videos like this and you can watch our previous webinars also from there and uh, thank you last but not least lastly for the uh, our two speakers uh, with their very busy time schedules they spend uh, time and energy for this webinar even uh, not only this time frame but from the preparations uh, from and from the beginning they was very supportive thank you uh, rear admiral kanchana banagoda and captain mihira for your valuable inputs for the youth uh, of maritime industry and then uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, thank you and good night This is the end of our webinar.